jacket all right in the summer uh, we have just been going through the Psalms some of the Psalms not this is not an exhaustive psalm by psalm study by any means but just as I've been reading through and uh, certain psalms uh, capture my attention then that's what we're doing so this morning we are in Psalm 40 so I'll read that through I'm using the NIV and this is how it reads I waited patiently for the Lord he turned to me and heard my cry he lifted me out of the slimy pit out of the mud and mire he set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand he put a new song in my mouth a hymn of praise to our God many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust who does not look to the proud to those who turn aside to false gods many O Lord my God are the wonders you have done the things you have planned for us no one can recount to you were I to speak and tell of them they would be too many to declare sacrifice and offering you did not desire but my ears you have pierced burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require then I said here I am I have come it is written about me in the scroll I desire to do your will O my God your law is within my heart I proclaim righteousness in the great assembly I do not seal my lips as you know O Lord I do not hide your righteousness in my heart I speak of your faithfulness and salvation I do not conceal your love and your truth from the great assembly do not withhold your mercy from me O Lord may your love and your truth always protect me for troubles without number surround me my sins have overtaken me and I cannot see they are more than the hairs of my head and my heart fails within me be pleased O Lord to save me O Lord come quickly to help me may all who seek to take my life be put to shame and confusion may all who desire my ruin be turned back in disgrace may those who say to me aha aha be appalled at their own shame may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you and may those who love your salvation always say the Lord be exalted yet I am poor and needy may the Lord think of me you are my help and my deliverer oh my God do not delay as we go to prayer this morning um, for those of you who are on the prayer chain we are uh, continuing to pray for Bob and Mary Drever and their family they lost their 25 year old son in an industrial accident uh, right at the end of July and uh, so there's still uh, the the pain of that loss and then Mary uh, Bob had to take her into the hospital because of a serious medical condition I haven't heard uh, the outcome of of that trip to emerge but uh, just let's continue to uphold the Drever family in our prayers and then for all the uh, university and college students who have come to Thunder Bay those who are are here this morning uh, we want to pray for you too as you settle into your studies and as you find your way around a city where the same street can change its name four or five times as you're making your way across that's that's one of the unique challenges of Thunder Bay and it's just a special delight for us to share that with you and um, and then of course we're all here with our own needs aren't we things that we have come through this past week challenges uh, things that perplex us that we're trying to sort out areas of our lives where we are seeking God's guidance and help uh, we bring all of those to worship today and God knows it and is aware of that so let's bring all those things to God in prayer shall we 
Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you for another day that we can meet here in the park uh, before it gets too cold. And um, so we just thank you for the world that you have made. And we thank you for the beauty in creation that speaks of your own majesty and, um, and is a reflection of your splendor. Father, we worship you as being our creator. But you're more than that. God, you have uh, made us and you've made us in a way so that we can know you. You have revealed yourself unmistakably in the scriptures and we thank you that we can draw near to you in this time of worship to sing your praise and to offer you our heart's devotion even as we have taken the bread and cup this morning to celebrate the atoning work of the Lord Jesus Christ that we when we become Christians we come to rest in uh, his saving work and in uh, redemption that is accomplished and applied to our lives so we we rejoice uh, that you have worked salvation on our behalf and that when we uh, lay hold by faith of the saving work of Jesus through his death and resurrection that we enter into a relationship with you that nothing in this world can separate us from and uh, so with all the challenges of life that we have faced even this past week as uh, students who are new to Thunder Bay are settling in and finding their way around and um, finding out what their course is going to be like and connecting with other students in their programs and all of those challenges and then Lord the just the challenges of life medical issues that we know many in our church family are struggling with those who have lost loved ones recently we think of Bob and Mary and their family we think of Barb Brown who lost her son back in July and um, Lord those who are undergoing treatment for cancer and other serious medical issues you are aware of them all and we bring these things to you and ask you as our loving Heavenly Father to continue working in all of our lives that which is well pleasing in your sight even as we come to your word this morning Father, we pray that you would speak to us and take your word that we are all looking at today, the same passage, take it and suit it in a special way to our individual needs. And we will trust you to do that work that only you can do by your Holy Spirit as we look to you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Waiting is a, a challenging thing to do. Uh, those who have uh, driven with me in the car, uh, they, they've commented on how impatient I can be. You know, they sort of, when they, when they ride in the car with me, it explodes their perception of this calm and, uh, you know, chilled guy. Uh, but put me behind a wheel and uh, yeah my family can tell you stories of, of uh, family holidays we all are challenged with uh, waiting uh, years ago the airport in Houston Texas was swamped with complaints from passengers who were standing at the baggage carousel waiting for their bags to come out so they hired more baggage handling personnel and that helped for a little while but you know in the end when the dust settled they still had a huge number of complaints from people about the long wait for their bags to come off the airplane so they came up with the ultimate solution and this worked this made the number of complaints drop significantly you know what they did? They moved the arrivals gate for the airplanes further away from the baggage carousel so that people would end up walking for five or six minutes before they got there. They increased the amount of time that people had 
to be engaged in something productive. And we're just going to pause. Speaking of airlines, waiting on God is a recurring theme in scriptures. You find it all over the place. In fact, I've got a little devotional in my study written by that uh, classic preacher from years ago, Andrew Murray. And it's a daily devotional where for a month where all 30 verses have to do with waiting on God. When you think about waiting on God, do you, is there a verse that comes to, my, to your mind about waiting on God? Does anybody have a verse to share about waiting on God? Yeah. Yeah, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Isaiah 40, 30 and 31. Any, any other passages that come to mind about waiting on God? Perry? That's right. Thank you. So Perry's just finishing off the, the latter part of that, of that verse. Anyway, there's lots of them, and we're looking at one of them today. So Psalm 40 is fairly well known. And uh, so as we get into this, we're looking at it in three sections. The first part is personal testimony, verses 1 to 3. Then we've got uh, some public principles or lessons that David wants to share, verses 4 to 10. And then we've got affirmations in verses 11 to 17. So Psalm 40 uh, and verse 1, it begins with this idea of waiting. I waited patiently for the Lord. And really, that translation is very weak because in the Hebrew, what you would do to get across the idea that you were you were waiting with endurance, not you know just sort of standing there twiddling your thumbs, you know, just like waiting for a bus or uh, something like that, but that you were engaged, your whole being was engaged with waiting, is that they would double that up. So a more accurate translation would be waiting. I waited for the Lord. And, and so the idea here is not inactivity, but faith that is hard at work in trusting God, wrestling with our doubts. Don't you find that? When, when you've laid hold of a promise in God's word and you're camping on that and you are looking to the Lord to come through for you, that you have to work hard to overcome the doubts that come into our minds. Or maybe while we are waiting, we are reminding ourselves that God is good. Or we are reminding ourselves that God is in control, that he has the situation that we are in, that we are waiting for him to resolve. When we look at the scriptures, uh, we find people all over the place that have to wait on the Lord. So Abraham was 75 years old when God came to this senior citizen. Both he and his wife were already beyond the years of having children. And God made him a promise that they would have a child. Do you remember how long Abraham and Sarah had to wait before the promise was fulfilled? Somebody know? 25 years. 25 years of waiting on God. I don't know if you've ever had to wait on God that long. Uh, you know, maybe those who are uh, more senior in their years uh, can tell stories of waiting that long on God. David who's writing Psalm 40. David was anointed king when he was just a young man, shortly after 
he slew the giant Goliath, and yet he had to wait until he was 30 before he took the throne of Israel. And he had opportunities, didn't he, to kill uh, Saul, who was hunting for him like a partridge in the forest. And yet David stained his, stayed his hand, and he waited on God. He, just, he gave the situation to the Lord and said, you know what? I'm just going to honor God in this and let him resolve the situation rather than take it into my own hand. So could I ask you a question this morning, just as we're dealing with this little concept of waiting on God, what are you waiting on God for? What are you waiting on God for? Are you waiting on God for the salvation of a loved one? Keep on praying. It's God's delight to save undeserving sinners. After all, he saved you, right? And he saved me. So we can trust that it's not that God doesn't want to, but that he's at work in his own way uh, to make that happen. Maybe you're waiting for a job. Maybe you're waiting um, for God to deal with a medical issue uh, that has plagued you for some time. But as we wait on the Lord, let's, let's be active. You know, sometimes uh, during our staycation, Sandy and I got out a few times canoeing, and we like urban canoeing right here in the city. In fact, the river here at the end of the street, we've canoed on there several times, and one of the advantages of urban canoeing is that as we go down the river, uh, we can pull up on the grass at Dairy Queen, And then after we have our ice cream cones, then when we get down to the Home Depot area, we can hook around the corner and there's a Starbucks. It's great. Urban canoeing is great. You'd never find that in uh, Quetico Park. Forget Quetico. Just, just canoe right here in the city. It's, it's super. Anyway, sometimes we see ducks in the river. And when you look at a duck, it just looks like it's sitting on the surface, right? But if you can see underneath, those little legs are just churning like crazy, aren't they? That's the kind of waiting that we need to be engaged with. Under the surface, God has things that he wants to accomplish in our lives, and it can only be doing or it can only be done as we engage actively in waiting on God. So there we are done. We have we have finished the first line of Psalm 40. Uh, did you bring a lunch? Okay. I promise we'll we'll get going a little faster. <clears throat> so when David uh, describes his situation. He says in verse 2 that he, he describes his situation like he's in a slimy pit. And the beauty of this passage of Scripture is that it isn't connected to anything specific in David's life. There are other Psalms that we can read where it will actually tell you that David wrote this Psalm when he was running for his life from King Saul. And so you can, you can connect that to, an his, to a historical event in David's life. Here, we have no clues like that. We've got at the beginning for the director of music. So it's a song to be sung. It was written by David, but we don't know the situation. And the beauty of a passage of scripture like this is that that means that you and I can take this song of deliverance into the slimy pits that you and I find ourselves in, where we are waiting on God. And uh, it's kind of like the passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, when Paul says that he prayed to the Lord three times for God to remove his thorn in the flesh, and we don't really know what that is. So again, there's another passage that we can take and apply to our lives. Because if it, if it was connected to something specific, we would be tempted to limit its application to those kinds of things. But 
here, because it's open-ended, we can bring this into whatever slimy pit we find ourselves in. So, as David uh, speaks in personal testimony in verses 1 to 3, he's very God-centered, and he lists five things that God does in answering David's request as he waited on the Lord. How ridiculous would it be if a person uh, fell off a boat and then when they were rescued they stood on the deck of the boat and bragged about how loudly they screamed or how violently they thrashed around in the water or oh did you see how tightly I gripped that life preserver wasn't that something they wouldn't be talking like that would they they, they would find the person on the boat who saw them in the water and they would go to every person who is involved in rescuing them from drowning and thank them and brag about how good it was that, that they didn't just let them go. And so that's what David is doing here. Five things that David uh, talks about here where he says uh, in verse 1, God turned to me. It's actually, the, the Hebrew is very um, descriptive. It's like, God bent down to me. It's meant to engage our minds in the idea that when God does something for us, He condescends. He comes down to where we are. He bends down to us in our need. He doesn't wait for us to, you know, get part way up the ladder and then he'll meet us halfway. That's not how a relationship with God works. God comes and finds us in our sin. God comes and finds us uh, in our separated relationship with him when there's nothing that we can do about it. God is always bending down to us. And it's, of course, the supreme act of God bending down to us is when he comes in the person of Jesus Christ to do the most work to rescue us from our greatest need. So uh, God, uh, he bent down to me. He heard my cry. So much of the scriptures talk about God's ears being open to our prayers. He lifted me out of the slimy pit. So there's God's rescue again, bringing us up from whatever we find ourselves in. He set my feet on a rock, so he gives us a firm place to stand, doesn't he? He brings us out of the mire of our own sin where we have disobeyed against God, and he sets us on the rock, Christ Jesus. And that is our eternal standing place that nobody uh, can knock us off of that place when God has placed our feet upon a rock. and. He puts a new song in our mouth. How many times in the Bible does it talk about people singing a new song? And I talked about that a little bit in the last time we were in the Psalms about how when Sandy and I were going to Bible college and Andre Crouch, he was the big deal back then. He was writing the new music uh, back in, in the 70s in our day. And of course today we have uh, Chris Tomlin and Matt Redman and other songwriters, Bob Coughlin, uh, who are writing great new songs. You know what the ultimate new song is going to be? I'll give you a, pre a peek uh, and a preview. Just turn with me to the last book of the Bible, to Revelation chapter 5, and it's sort of, it's sort of like watching dominoes fall when you read uh, Revelation chapter 4, which gives us the setting of the throne room in heaven, and then the singing and the praise that takes place in Revelation chapter 5. So here's uh, the Lamb looking as if it had been slain. God is on the throne, and it says that the, uh, the 24 elders, they worship the Lord, and it says in verse 9, they sang a new song. 
You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe, tongue, language, and people and nation and you made them to be kingdom and priests to serve God and they will reign on the earth. So they, they have finished singing their new song. Look at what happens next in the text. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. So the 24 elders, they've sung a new song. All of a sudden, these 10,000 times 10,000 angels encircle the scene and, and they uh, say, they sing in a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise and then this is where we come in in verse 13 then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever so it's like one one song is just a domino effect. Somebody sings a new song and then another group enters with their song and then everybody joins in on the chorus at the end. And it's just kind of neat to see that unfold when, when you think that when we get to heaven, when God lands us safe on heaven's shore, that we are going to enter in uh, to the new song that is being sung there in God's presence. It, it, it's gonna be mind blowing when we are standing there fully redeemed and, and fully in possession of all that Jesus died on the cross to win on our behalf. Okay, now we get into verses 4 to 10 in Psalm 40 where David moves from his personal testimony to, to some uh, public principles, some, some lessons that he wants to share with you and I. And the first one is that there are untold blessings for those who trust in God. Verses 4 and 5, where he simply he makes the statement, blessed is the one who makes the Lord whose trust. Sometimes when we're waiting on God, we are tempted to reach for another solution that we know would work. I'll give you an example. I already gave you an example from, from David's life when he was anointed as king as a young man and then had to wait till he was 30 to take the throne. And he had the opportunity to kill Saul, but he didn't. It would have, it would have opened the throne for him to become king. That would have been very pragmatic he could have had the idea, you know what, I'm going to fulfill God's promise and kill the rascal who's on the throne right now, who really isn't a man after God's own heart, but he didn't. He waited. Now, another king in Israel, I think, that serves as a very good example is Asa. King Asa, in 2 Chronicles, you can read his story, 2 Chronicles 14 to 16. We aren't going to look in depth at that, but Asa had a heart for God. He began his reign over Israel with a reform and a revival, and he called the people back to God. And when he was faced with an overwhelming army, he trusted God, and God beat the bad guys on behalf of Israel. He waited on the Lord, and God came through. You read a little bit further in the story, into chapter 15, and now Asa is facing another overwhelming army. What does he do? He doesn't trust in God. He does what every other king on the block does, and that is, okay, you've got this overwhelming army, you calculate the odds, you reach over to King B in the neighboring country beside you, and you hire his army to come and whoop the bad guys. What do you think the result of that was? They beat the bad guys. It worked. Pragmatism worked. He didn't even have to bother God about that. Wrong. 
he should have trusted God because then a prophet came and rebuked him for his lack of waiting on the Lord. And then Asa's life ends in a very pitiful kind of a way because even when he got sick, it says he never, he never brought that need to the Lord. And uh, his, his life ends uh, just in a, in a really sorry kind of a way. And yet he knew what it was to trust in God. You and I know what that's like too. I'm sure if we had time this morning, we could share testimonies of how God rescued us from a slimy pit and, and just the wonderful way uh, that, he, that he worked in our lives. But anyway, there's blessings there. Blessings too numerous to count, David says in verses 4 and 5, uh, for those who trust in the Lord. When you get into verses 6 to 8, I'm calling this the sacrifice of full surrender. Look at, look at verse 6. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have pierced. You're thinking, what's up with the pierced ears? I, I don't have pierced ears. And, uh, you know, that's okay if you do. At least if, you're, if your parents let you. Um, but, you know, so David's been rescued from this slimy pit. And he's thinking, what can I do here to honor God? Should I offer, you know, a goat? Uh, these sacrifices were prescribed in the Old Testament, right? The, the book of Leviticus is kind of like a priest's manual for how to offer various animal sacrifices to God. And you go through, and if it was this kind of sacrifice, then you killed the animal here, and you poured out its blood here, and you hacked off pieces, and they, you know, did various things, and some of it you burned on the altar, and all the different sacrifices were different, right? It would be a horrible thing for a vegetarian back then. But anyway, because um, a zucchini wouldn't work. You couldn't offer a zucchini. Uh, it had to be an animal. And so there's all these animal sacrifices, and yet David says here in verse 6, sacrifice and offerings, ultimately they don't really delight God. They don't ultimately honor Him. And so what we're seeing here in Psalm 40 is just a little tease towards the idea that all of that Old Testament sacrificial system was going to come to an end. But he says, instead, instead of offering another animal sacrifice to honor the God who lifted me out of the slimy pit, I am going to offer myself to God. So it's like what David is saying in verse 6 is, God, thank you, thank you, thank you for rescuing me. And instead of an animal sacrifice, I am saying, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. That is what David is doing in verse 6. He's saying we need to go beyond this idea that God does this for me, so I do this for him, and God does this for me, so I will go to church this many Sundays to, you know, just to pay God back, and, and that kind of uh, tit-for-tat kind of relationship, you know, that's, that's what the nations around Israel did, was that if you wanted rain, then you would sacrifice an animal, do a special dance or whatever, and hopefully the rain god would answer, or if you needed the, the sunny weather, then you'd do, you know, you'd do some other kind of a dance and incantation. And it was always this, I'll do this, and you do this, and that kind of thing. And it's, it's just not going to work with the God who spoke the world into existence and created us to know and love him. It's not going to work with that God. And so in response to his rescue, David says, I'm not going to offer another animal sacrifice. But I am going to say to you, God, take my whole self. Here I am. Now, 
we've mentioned a number of times that because David was a prophet, that oftentimes the scriptures are operating at a couple of different levels. So there's the level of David's own experience. Was David in a slimy pit that, uh, you know, typified some problem that he had in his life? Yes. Did God rescue him? Yes. Did David offer his whole self? Yes. But as a prophet, David also spoke for Christ. So there is a higher level of application in Psalm 40 that the author of Hebrews picks up on. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. And here, Psalm 40, verses 6 to 8, is applied directly to Jesus Christ. This, this is really fascinating to me. Look at what it says in Hebrews 10, verse 5. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, and he quotes Psalm 40, verses 6 to 8. I thought that was David. It was, but at a higher level, it's Jesus. Jesus, who when he comes into the world, he says, sacrifice. You don't need another animal sacrifices. It's just a reminder by way of repetition that they, they had to be offered over and over and over again, that these ultimately do not take care of the problem of sin. They don't ultimately please God. God is looking for something else. So what does uh, Jesus say? Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. And there's nothing about pierced ears. In Hebrews 10 verse 5. He changed the word of God. Because the original says, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have pierced. And then when, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the author of Hebrews takes that passage and in Hebrews applies it to Jesus, he says, but a body you have pierced. What's up with? Okay. Back to the pierced ears. The phrase is actually very descriptive because it says, but by ears you have dug out. Does that give you a different idea than pierced ears. We hear pierced ears and we think earrings, right? That's not the idea in Psalm 40 and verse 6. The idea, did your mom ever, did your mom ever tell you when you were growing up, or maybe she still is telling you, clean out your ears and listen. <laughs> Get the wax out of your ears. What's wrong with you kids? Are you hard of hearing? Your parents ever say things like that to you? I know, and it scarred you, right? Too bad. Um, anyway, so, so the idea back in, in Psalm 40 is that David says, I'm not going to offer another animal sacrifice. My ears you have dug out so that I can listen and respond and obey your word that tells me to offer my whole self to you. That's the connection. Here I am, body, soul, everything in my life belongs to you because I've listened and I've obeyed the Word of God. That's the connection between ears and then what we find when we get to Hebrews chapter 10, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. It gets you to the same place as Psalm 40, verse 6, but it just uses a different idiom in the same way that languages use different ideas, right? 
You and I can say, after the service today, we can say, I am going home, right? We have that English word home. How would you say it in French? How do you say, I am going home in French? Anybody want to give it a try? Pardon? Well, yeah, chez, chez vous, if you're going to your house, or chez moi, uh, je rentre uh, chez moi, if I am going to my house, or à la maison, if, if you just want to say, I'm going to the house. But French doesn't have a word for home. It has a word for house, like we do in English, but it doesn't have, it doesn't have that English idiom, home, you know, that makes you feel all warm and fuzzy inside when you say the word home. Can't do that in French. You can say, you can say chez moi to the place, to, to my place, or uh, uh, à la maison, to the house which is very kind of third party and cold. But it's not like home, you see. So that's the problem. And, and what we see here between Psalm 40, verse 6 and Hebrews 10, verse 5 is a change in idiom because the author of Hebrews is using, using the Greek Old Testament, not the Hebrew. And they used a different idiom when they brought that idea across. But it still ends you up in the same place that Christ, when he came into the world, he said, I am listening to God. You do not need another animal sacrifice. I have listened. My ears have been cleared. And I am listening exclusively to my Father. Everything I do is, is in obedience to my Heavenly Father. And that is leading me to take my body and everything about me and to to offer that to God, ultimately in the atoning sacrifice that we find on uh, Calvary at the cross. So there's the sacrifice of uh, complete surrender. It's kind of like uh, what Paul does in Romans chapter 12 when he, when he says to the Romans, I urge you brothers in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices wholly acceptable. That's our response as well, right? Because of God's rescue in our lives. Okay, then he goes public, verses 9 to 10, uh, back in Psalm 40. He is not going to hide God's righteousness. He's not going to conceal his love. He is going to declare it publicly. And again, this is something that we need to do. This, this needs to characterize the way that you and I talk about stuff that happens in our lives. So I was talking with Riley and Joe, who are here for the first time, and uh, they've come up here from St. Catharines. Do you know how they ended up at a church in the park with us today? Because Riley, when he was picking up his suit for their wedding, which I'm assuming happened fairly recently, yeah, congrats newlyweds. When Riley was picking up his suit for their wedding a short time ago, my stepbrother, who lives in St. Catharines, was there. And they started talking about their move to Thunder Bay and John recommended that they come to West Fort Baptist Church. We can thank our lucky stars, right? No. Lucky stars might be a cereal, but it has nothing to do with Riley and Joel being here today. God does. God does. And we need to work at 
at describing to our friends and family members who don't know Jesus. We need to use the kind of language that points them to God when, when wonderful things happen. Why don't, we, why don't we give God the glory? Why don't we give him the praise? Why don't we go public with acknowledging that I have a heavenly Father who is interested in every single aspect of my life down to the smallest thing. Let that characterize the way that we talk about God's involvement in our lives. And maybe God will use that to pique their interest, to want to know more so that we can talk about the good news of Jesus Christ. Now we come to the last section and quickly I'll just say here that he just makes a number of affirmations in verses uh, 11 down to 17. I would suggest, and I'm, you know I'm always doing this, but I'm going to keep using the NIV. And in verse 11, it, it phrases verse 11 like a prayer. Do not withhold your mercy from me, O Lord. May your love and truth always protect me. And it would be better if we saw it just as David just affirming, making a statement, making a declaration, so that it would read something like this. You, O Lord, will not withhold your mercy from me. Your love and your truth will always protect me. So there is David as he's bringing this song in for a landing. What he's doing is he's making affirmations at the end. And he lists the area where God's love and truth will protect us. It will protect us in the area uh, first and most surprisingly in the area of sin. That when you and I stray from God and we depart from his ways and, and we go away from the Lord, God's love is faithful to protect us even there. He will not let us go. He will discipline us like a loving father. And he, he has any number of means at his disposal to get our attention and to lovingly bring us back on track. So even when we personally and intentionally disobey God, God's steadfast love will protect us even then and bring us back into a right relationship with him. So that's in verse 12, a declaration about God's protection against personal enemies in verses 13 to 15. Are there any people in your circles of relationships that would love to see you as a Christian fall flat on your face? Do you have any people around you like that at school, in the workplace, in your neighborhood, in your family, that would love to see your life hit the fan and come apart at the seams? They would rejoice over your downfall. Even then, God, David affirms that God, God's steadfast love will protect us even when there are enemies. And I mean, we live in a world, right, that's hostile to the things that you and I believe. Our whole culture that was established on Christian principles and, and the foundational truths of the Bible has turned completely against that now. And then, fourthly, God's protection, God's love and truth will protect all those who seek God, verse 16, and then even me, he says in uh, verse 17, in that last verse, he says, yet I am poor and needy. You know what? As a Christian, that really never changes, right? 
that we are always on the receiving end of God's blessings and his work on our behalf. There's never a situation in our lives where we should say to God, you know what, God, I'm not going to bother you with this. I've got this. You can, you can take a break working on my behalf. In other words, we're saying to God, you know what, God, in this area of my life, I am not poor and needy. I do not need your help. Yikes! <laughs> um, that's the opposite of uh, Philippians 4, what it says, do not be anxious for anything but in everything with prayer and supplication. Let your requests be made known unto God. In everything. Pray about everything. Because we need God's help in every situation that we face. You know, uh, we've talked about being in trouble and asking for God's help, but it, but it really starts. And, and maybe this is where, where you need a word of encouragement. If you don't consider yourself to be a Christian yet, you're interested, you're exploring, uh, you're interested in learning more about Jesus Christ, but you're not there yet. You haven't put your faith and trust in him. You need to see yourself in the slimy pit of sin, separated from God because of your own disobedience, and that you are in such a mess that you can't do anything about it. But God, in love, sent his Son, who did all the work to lift you out of the slimy pit, to put your feet on a rock, to give you a new song to sing. So we would encourage you, keep reading, keep exploring, read the gospel accounts of the life of Jesus Christ and ask God to open your heart uh, to the beauty and the majesty of his saving work found in the Lord Jesus. All right, um, I'm gonna close in a word of prayer and maybe I'll, I'll just suggest up here over by this tree, uh, university and college students, if you want to connect to one another. Uh, we got a couple of Andrews here today. We've got uh, Eddie, who's in the uh, aviation program. He's a veteran at uh, Confederation College and uh, others who are new uh, to Thunder Bay. Um, yeah, it just might be good. I'm just offering a suggestion. But uh, let's close in prayer. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, uh, we just thank you so much that when we find ourselves in a slimy pit, uh, maybe even of our own doing because of our own foolishness or disobedience, that you are not content to leave us there. But when we cry out to you for help, that you bend down, you're always bending down to help us, to rescue us, to lift us out of the muck and the mire, to set our feet upon a rock, and to give us a new song to sing. So, Father, just be faithful in your love, in your love and truth to continue working in our lives all that you uh, want to accomplish, and we will give you the praise and the glory. Dismiss us now from this time of worship in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Oh yeah, wire. Thank you.